I don't want to talk. Breaking Beige is the journey of three 30-something mums trying to figure out who the hell they are post-babies. We can't be the only ones who feel like this. Who the fuck are we now? Just a mum is wearing thin. We want more. Finding our strengths, ditching the act of wearing and washing our hair. This is the journey of how we will gain our self-worth back and inspire you to do the same. Break the beige. Be a hot bitch. I don't want to talk. So yeah. today we have a very special guest. We've got Micah Allen on from <laughs> Femme Nutrition. <laughs> Uh, Micah is a women's health dietitian. Um, she is here to teach us the power of nutrition for hormone health. Uh, Micah is a registered dietitian and she currently works on long term conditions. conditions. Dietitian in the community. Got it. Yeah. Nailed. <laughs> I nailed that. <laughs> You're welcome. What an intro. <laughs> No, it's so good to have you here. We've had so many people asking all about uh, perimenopause this and is the big one today. hormones. We yeah. constantly talk about how hormones run our lives uh, and how they make us feel. So, yeah, we're really happy to have you here today. Mm. Thanks, guys. Um, Stoked to be here. Yeah. And I guess just before we crack into the questions that some of our listeners have sent in, um, just wondered, yeah, if you could give us a bit of a background and intro on who you are and yeah, sure. what life's like for Micah. Yeah. So I have grown up in Taranaki. I actually grew up in Stratford. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Shout from Openaki. Yeah. I'm from Openaki. I yeah. knew we had a connection. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, went to Dunedin and did uh, my undergraduate. So three year Bachelor of Science majoring in human nutrition. Then finished that. Went to Auckland, Massey University, and did my master's, which was two years. Um, of placement, so clinical placement in hospitals and like public health settings and writing a thesis, which is a bloody slog. Yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> and then one of my placements was actually at Northland Hospital, which at the time, if I'm being honest, was pretty gutted that I was assigned there. <laughs> um, but ended up friggin' loving Northland, got my first job there working as a renal dietitian. So with kidneys yeah. <laughs> wow. um, people yeah. on dialysis so was wow. doing that for like a year and a half and then planning on going overseas moved back here for a month um so still, small. He, still here <laughs> oh. <laughs> it happens no, COVID, hey, the just it. Sucks it in. <laughs> sucked into the necky vortex now um <laughs> covid yeah. so then covid happened and ended up getting my job that i'm in right now which is long-term conditions dietitian um in the community but I've always had a real passion since I graduated for women's health and I feel like right. it's such an untapped area. Yeah. Um, and it was actually funny when you called me, Gina, and asked why, what got me into women's health or like hormone health and nutrition. Yeah. And I was like, um, selfish reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Like, I'm a woman, I've got a period, I get PMS, selfish reasons. Yeah. But I think... Um, the more I learned about the topic, the more I felt passionate to like share it with mm. other women and share how, you know, how amazing hormones actually can be. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for like sure. Like the benefits from them, they can be good as well. Yeah, as yeah totally. And like, I guess, obviously, um, being a dietitian, like the power of nutrition and lifestyle on our hormones and how yeah. it can affect our everyday lives as mm. well yeah 100% yeah I'm definitely keen on learning more because I know um even with the skin yep. so at yeah, the salon yeah. huge so I see someone with big like you know like cystic acne or something like that and I'm like mm. like a cleanse is not going to help this you know like it's deep, and, it's deep. Yeah. and we talk about hormones heaps yeah and there's like I only know the very surface of it yeah and it goes so much deeper you know so it affects every part of the body Totally. Um, so, yeah, yep. interested to learn more. Same. I'm excited. <laughs> and we've got Kate. Kate's sitting over on the couch. <laughs> we miss you. She's either <laughs> she's either taking sneaky photos of us or she's on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Both. <laughs> but we love you, Kate. She's here. She's here. Um, awesome. So, shall we, um, shall we crack into some mm -hmm. of these questions? Yeah. Yep. Well, good. Um, right. So, thanks everyone who sent questions in. Yep. Um, the yeah, they're really good and they're really well covered off. And there were a few in there that I would really like to know the answers to as well. So, yep. um, we'll just get into it. Yeah. So, number one, would you recommend a natural hormonal supplement, for example, New Woman Thirty? 
Yeah, so I, if I'm being honest, I haven't actually looked into New Woman 30, but there are a lot of supplements. I mean, obviously we try and do diet, nutrition first, yes. but sometimes there are room for supplements. And I guess that's where working with a health professional um, yeah, agreed. <laughs> can agreed. definitely yeah. like identify where those gaps might be and based on, you know, what you're experiencing, whether it's PMS or, you know, perimenopause symptoms or whatever it might be, you know, there might be an appropriate supplement that could help you with symptom management or feeling a bit better or getting regular cycles or whatever the issue might be. So there's definitely room for supplements. I think on that supplement note, supplements are not regulated. So, that is you know, so like crazy. crazy. Yeah, so you can, you know, they could be from any form of any dose of, you know, like whatever claim they want. So it is being mindful of that with supplements too. And I guess that's where I would encourage people to like work alongside a health professional because mm. um, it's, yeah, just taking them willy-nilly. You're probably not going to get the, you know, like the therapeutic benefits that you're after and you're probably going to waste your money. Like <laughs> wow, <wild, wild laughs> west out there. Right? Yeah, but you look at the row. There's like a whole flipping row in the supermarket yeah. Yeah. of crap. Yeah, It's yeah. crap. And then you like, even you go on to, I don't know, when you look at all those supplements or you go on to like a health store with the supplements, it's so overwhelming. And then yeah. you're like in there thinking, shit, do I need to be taking all of these? Like, mm. y- but you feel like. Might, <laughs> yeah, you might just actually need to go and get some really good quality protein, fruits and vegetables, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that might be but a bit yeah, of, yeah, like uh, yeah. they definitely have a place, but it's knowing like what kind of what dose, yeah. what form, how much. Yeah. All of that is really important. Mm. Otherwise, yeah, they might be a waste of money. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually a really good answer. And I think we've talked before on the podcast about how sometimes you just need to find, yeah, like one or two or whatever works for people, like one person who you really trust mm-hmm. and they're invested in you, they know your background, mm. like with the skin, mm-hmm. you know, and actually, yeah, work with that person who kind of has that intricate understanding of your health and your well-being and, and where you want to go. So mm-hmm. um, I guess that's where you come in as well and you do online consults. So yep. good to good to note. And yeah, obviously real hard to answer a question that's like, oh, I don't, oh, like is yeah. this supplement good? Because you don't know that person's background. So, yeah, and yeah. I think as well, like in a dietetic assessment, we go through everything, like yeah. medical history, blood results, medications, any supplements mm. that you are on, your diet history, social things like routine and work and family because that plays a huge role. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult to answer like quite a specific question mm. about someone without knowing the background. The full the background. Of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think supplements can play a role for sure. Yeah. Good answer. Good answer. Absolutely. Do you want to ask the next one, Renee? Yeah, I do, but I want to go straight to the rage. <laughs> <laughs> Like, this is probably a question for, like, further down, but I'm like, oh, I need to know that I'm not a complete crazy person. <laughs> Can you is, diagnose this me? This like, <laughs> such a good question. How do you decipher between mum rage and a hormone imbalance? Yeah, I saw that one. I'm like, ooh, hard question to answer. <laughs> it's like a bit of a broad, but, like... I think um, just quickly like running through because it's um just to set the scene a little bit of like what's actually going on with our hormones if we look at the menstrual cycle just very briefly and then get on to what yeah. happens during Absolutely. perimenopause yeah so day one of our cycle being day one of our period both like all our hormones are relatively low at this point each month our brain will release a, a gland in our brain called pituitary gland which is does lots of endocrine things in our body, will release hormones called follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And they pretty much tell our ovaries to get, like, revved up, like, let's, let's go. Like, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Babies. <laughs> um, so, uh, what was that again? Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I read that so many times. Is that a professional yeah. term? Uh, I say that this in to my five clients. Years of study? <laughs> Learned that in my master's. Um, <laughs> She um, like yeah. entered her paper and it was like, let's go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's go hormones. Oh, yeah, so um, pretty much tells our ovaries to get started. Um, and the, they're essentially like the precursors for the more well-known like progesterone and estrogen. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, tell our ovaries to get into it each month. Most of us know that we're born with all our eggs Yep, like our egg reserves. So yep. each month our body will like go in, grab an egg from that reserve to ripen up, to ovulate. When we ovulate, the estrogen peaks. So our estrogen is peaking. Yep. 
the benefits that estrogen has when it's at that higher peak is it's very intertwined with serotonin. Most of us know what serotonin mm-hmm. does. It makes us feel really good, makes us feel happy, increases our libido, mm-hmm. makes us feel um, probably like a bit more confident. We feel pretty good around this time. Yeah. When you think about it, if you think of like evolution and... I'm like, what day is this? <laughs> <laughs> what day is that? Um, that happens when you're most fertile. <laughs> Ovulation, babe. <laughs> it does. So, oh, I think when we think about like uh, evolution and instinct, it's like the most natural thing ever to mm. reproduce. Yeah. It's essentially like the hormone that's helping us do that increasing sex drive, making us feel really good, feel really confident, feel really happy in that tiny mm. little window that we're fertile. So, so like when I – sorry, this is very all like, oh, me. Yeah. When I ovulate, I don't get any pain during my period. I get it when I ovulate. Like I literally feel like I can just feel the egg. Like, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Some women will – painful. Some women will feel ovulation pain. Some women will have no don't idea. feel it. Yeah, right. But, um, so that's where you're at your peak. Yeah. And <clears throat> good to know. Apparently you smell good to other men too, right? Mm. It's real instinctual. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah, sounds about right. I mean, when you look at all the other things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing as well that happens with that peak in estrogen is estrogen makes us, um, well, helps us to metabolise carbohydrate more efficiently than yeah. other times in our cycle. So um, essentially it's just making us, we can, we're better at utilising our food as fuel, which can sometimes act as like a slight natural appetite suppressant yeah um so once we ovulate um estrogen will begin to drop and then progesterone begins to increase um also i I suppose like once you ovulate one of two things are going to happen you're either going to have a fertilized egg or more commonly it's not going to be fertilized (laughs) and the estrogen will drop the progesterone will pick up And progesterone has its own raft of benefits. So it's like the calming hormone. It makes us feel super calm and content, has like a natural anti-anxiety effect. Um, It's also the thing that keeps the endometrium lining stuck to the walls. Um, So, you know, just talking about those things, estrogen's got its own benefits, progesterone's got its own benefits. Mm, it's is, also cons. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well, I think the cons is when they drop away. Yeah. So they do really good. Both of those things are amazing. Both of those hormones are amazing. As we near our period, um, if you go back to that idea that progesterone is the thing that keeps the endometrium stuck there, mm. we've got to get our period at some point. So progesterone's got to drop away and that is then when the endometrium will fall away and we'll get our period. That's the when we think about so those, um, you make it sound really awesome though. <laughs> like you're making ovulation and periods sound like so great. But I think when we think <laughs> about like those benefits that come with those hormones, it's actually the withdrawal that makes yeah. it shit, right? Mm, so hormones come down. Yeah. Mm. So progesterone makes us feel really calm, and that anti-anxiety effect. We can usually handle stress a little bit better during that yeah. time. You're essentially having a withdrawal from something that makes you very calm and content which right. makes sense when we think of things like PMS when we feel really irritated and tearful and moody and, and rocking in a corner it's essentially <laughs> yeah, like, so I Kate's think mine. <clears throat> so it's actually the withdrawal of those hormones that are leading to not the actual hormones that's themselves. just yeah that's yeah. literally like the end that's all I need <laughs> that's all I need to know <laughs> like that is so incredible don't you think it's such a shame it's not explained so well like I mean maybe yeah. it is now at school <clears throat> no. like even when you're younger yeah it's so like, like the it's big, so no fully idea. explained yeah, yeah. like yeah. just we could just three put holes. that into a video play it and save <laughs> the embarrassment sussed. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah so I think when we think of perimenopause um what happens is progesterone begins to gradually decrease yeah Estrogen is more erratic. So it's like every month our body's going into that reserve and some months it might not find an egg. It's getting harder and harder because that reserve's getting lower and lower. So it's like our body's going in, it might not find an egg one month so we don't get that peak in estrogen and we can't get the progesterone without that peak. So then it has that flow on effect again from not having those You've literally just simplified (laughs) the whole, yeah, amazing. (coughs) You can cut in. Still get a normal period? 
So that would be um, you can have a period without ovulation. Yeah. Um, it might be lighter and shorter, but usually when that starts to happen is when we'll begin to get those irregular periods. So you might get a period and then you might not have one for two months and then you'll have three and then you'll have none. Yeah. For, you know, and right it'll now. start to be. Um, <laughs> and so because, um, yeah, like that gradual reduction in progesterone um, might be – that first sign. Some some women might not notice it, but going mm. back to that question of what's rage. the difference between mum rage and if I'm in perimenopause, the classic symptom of that irregular periods is often that first one that people are like, oh, something's changing. Mm. But mm. some people might notice a change prior to that and that mm. might be because of the progesterone gradually. If you and think, like dealing with things less, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. so like normally something that you – you know, in your monthly cycle and you're like, that would just flow off my back and I'm like yelling and screaming. I'm like, why am I being such a crazy woman? Yeah. And then I feel really bad about it. Yeah, and it might feel like that PMS is really heightened or like, mm. um, yeah, so that potentially is like that gradual. Um, I mean, there's a lot of factors it could be, but when we're talking about perimenopause, that gradual reduction in progesterone, that anti-anxiety calming hormone mm -hmm. is often that first thing. And, and I mean, lots of women their first symptom might be anxiety or mood disturbances before anything else. So, but it's it's obviously really different for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Depends on age and different factors. <clears throat> like you said, you go back to lifestyle and all of that as well and what people are doing with their routine and mm. yeah. Yeah. So something in your role, sorry, I'm getting carried away. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> so in your role now, if you're working for the public health system, yeah. is – how do people get like is it a cost can you covered by health insurance do you have to be on a long waiting list like how yep. does it so, work so um currently my full-time job is a long-term conditions dietitian in the community and that is I'm working with the GP practice all the GP practices in Taranaki yep. so it's a free service mm -hmm. um but in that role I'm essentially like I don't know my bread and butter would be like type 2 diabetes cardiovascular disease for um, people that are really I love that sick diabetes is my yeah. bread and butter like I love it <laughs> <laughs> Literally my bread That's and butter. Like ultimate joke. Like, <laughs> to You're so my bad. That's so my, bad. It's my fruit um, and sugar. <laughs> but then obviously like with femme is my like little side yes. pus that's like so that's private. private and that's yeah. um So someone yeah. that's like perimenopausal is not gonna get through to you past the heart and the diabetes, which sounds horrible, but you have to be quite bad to see you in your role um, now. Yeah, well you have to have a long term condition, but I guess I mean I do see a lot of perimenopausal women mm. because, and I can talk about this soon, but like our risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes does go up with those like changes to our metabolism. Is there anything you can do kind of throughout your cycle to, if you are seeing those, you know, PMS symptoms or you are feeling really angry as those hormones drop away? Um, for a lot of people, it's like at different times, but like for me, it's always that week before my period. I've mm. talked about this all the time, but like, is there anything you can do kind of throughout your cycle that can help alleviate kind of, you know, like having those drops yeah. in hormones? Um, I think firstly, it depends on how severe those are. If you feel like, cause some people feel like they are at times like debilitating mm. that PMS and that those feelings that can come about. Yep. If it's like that, it's definitely worth probably talking to a health professional or um, having like a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Yep. Mm. But in general, I think firstly understanding like what we just talked about, understanding yeah. what is going on because you're way kinder to yourself and you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm having like a withdrawal of hormones that are making me feel yeah, really I good. I love that. Track um, your yeah. cycle. Because, yeah. you know, I think understanding that you can be a little bit kinder like, okay, well, I'm probably not going to go do that hit workout and try and do a million and one things. Yeah. I might just take a little bit better care of myself. Yeah. <laughs> not going to socialise. And not try and yeah. do like everything in one day. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, just taking it easy is, yeah. And I think um, fueling appropriately. Yeah. Um, often before – our period we can experience cravings um, and so many of us will try and fight those cravings because we're trying to be like healthy, healthy. or yeah. we might be restricting but our before our period our basal metabolic rate can increase which is essentially the energy just to live yeah by a couple of hundred calories oh, so you can have that chocolate yeah it's, our body is literally trying to tell us something. So again, making sure you're fueling right. So like take an extra snack with you or 
you know, put some cheese and hummus in your sandwich or like make sure throughout your day you're yeah. actually getting in enough nutrients. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think with PMS there's, there's a whole raft, cravings, taking care of yourself. Um, there are a few supplements that can help with um, like cramps and mood as well. Omega-3s, I've done yep. a post on that. I feel like I bang on about omega-3s to everyone about everything. Um, but omega-3s are like a potent anti-inflammatory. So making sure that we're meeting requirements. So yep. two to three servings of oily fish a week. If you're not doing that or you don't eat fish. Yeah, what's your substitute there? A supplement. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can get omega-3 through things like flax seeds and chia seeds. Yes. Um, yeah. It's a little bit harder to meet those requirements. Yeah. But, yeah, potentially that's where a, a supplement might be useful. Um, and things like magnesium, so like leafy greens and whole grains um, can help. Magnesium can help with cramps but also um, help stabilise mood. Yeah. Mm. Um, B vitamins also help with um, PMS too. There's What's quite a few good? things. Yeah. Yeah. A few yeah. things up your sli- up, up, up my sleeve. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> up your Got sleeve, a whole my sleeve. Board. <laughs> All of our sleeves. <laughs> Just pull them out. I think um, I've heard, I've actually heard that uh, chocolate like. You often will crave chocolate because it's a source of magnesium. Yeah, I don't like know if it's dark, a high, dark, yeah, dark I don't know chocolate, if it's a high yeah. potent form of magnesium, but yeah. like sometimes. I don't know about you, like, but I never crave dark chocolate. Like nah. I can have one thing. Like, give me I'm the like, creamy milk. <laughs> <laughs> Whitaker's creamy milk. Yeah, um, pass like, on the dark. <laughs> I mean, you can have one or two, but it's but nice to believe sometimes. Yeah, yeah totally, for sure. totally, hundred <laughs> percent. <clears throat> um, right, I have one here. Actually, I think you just answered this. I am a non-red meat eater. I have an inflammatory disease. I eat lots of nuts and seeds, etc. Is it true that after menopause, I don't face to worry about much? Iron? Don't have to worry. Have to don't have. You love that. Don't have to worry about much iron. Iron. Yes. So that is correct. Um, after menopause, our iron requirements drop to the same as a male, so eight Mm. milligrams per day, but that's after menopause, after being 12 consecutive months with no period. So during perimenopause, it still applies of normal iron requirements, which is 18 milligrams. Yeah. So go back to that. So the thing that um, sets in stone that you're post-menopause is if you've been 12 months without a period. 12 consecutive months, yep. So if you were on the the 10th month and you got your period, start. Time starts again. Yep. Okay, I never knew that. Yeah. That's really so, interesting. Um, yeah, so that is once menopause has been achieved after 12 consecutive months. So once that's achieved, yep, iron requirements go yes, down to, to the yep. same as uh, yeah males, which is eight milligrams. Prior to that, it's 18 milligrams. Um, and I think that's really important to note too because sometimes, well, for some women, a symptom might be heavy periods during perimenopause because mm, yeah. our hormones are so like even a your requirements might, might go up in that time yeah. even. Mm. Yeah. And she mentioned as well about not eating red meat. So mm. it's worth noting as well. Um, there's like two types of iron. So we've got our heme iron, which is red meat and like chicken, chicken yeah. and seafood. That's really easily absorbed by our body. So most of the iron content in that we'll be able to absorb. And then our non-heme, which is our plant-based um, like legumes and nuts and seeds and vegetables and pulses and that kind of thing, it will still contain iron, less iron, but we will not be able to absorb all of that. So it's it can be quite hard to meet your requirements when you're not having the heme iron. You can definitely meet them, but it's just something worth noting during that perimenopause phase or any phase, if you're experiencing heavy periods and not having heme sources of iron, mm. probably getting your iron checked relatively regular, mm. regularly um, is worth... Yeah, it's good advice, yeah. yeah. Um, and o- obviously supplements. Yeah. If, yeah. Because you uh, can't get it through the red meat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because you've got to eat that red meat. Um, <laughs> just off the back of that as well, there's a question here from Freya, who very kindly yeah. recommended <laughs> that we get you on. Shout out. And <laughs> she's said, um, good sources of protein, easy lunch ideas. I think that's helpful for anyone regardless yeah. of um, yeah, regardless yeah. of where they're at. So um, protein, obviously the classic ones like your meat, chicken, fish, eggs, um, but also like beans and lentils, legumes, tofu, 
uh, edamame beans, yep. quinoa, nuts and seeds, nut butters, um, dairy. Poor old dairy. I feel like it's a hard time these days. But dairy, <laughs> cheese, um, milk, cottage cheese, that kind of stuff. Mm. Bloody good source of um, protein. Yep. And I think lunch ideas – I am a massive fan of I cook dinner and I bulk it up and dish up a container. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two birds, one easy. stone. Yeah. Um, that always works. And I feel like that's really easy. Like, yeah, you could fart us around doing meal prep on your Sunday afternoon, but like, mm-hmm. who wants to be doing Nobody, that? Nobody, not me. No. Yeah. So, I'm I mean, if you're into it, go for it. But I'm personally lazy <laughs> and I don't want to do that <laughs> the fact that you cook dinner is pretty good <laughs> I'm, I'm like there's no extra effort required to like chuck in a few extra veggies and yeah. a bit more protein at dinner to then get lunch otherwise the humble sandwich yeah can't beat it or like a wrap um and I think you can have so much variety. I feel like whenever I recommend someone like a wrap or a sandwich, it's like, oh, yeah, cool. Um, but you can have we so can much variety. Into that. Yeah. yeah. As long as, you know, if you think of uh, bread having some like a high quality, high fiber bread or a wholemeal wrap or a, there's really good low carb wraps out there now um, with a really good protein source and then load it up with some non starchy veggies for volume and then get a bit of flavor, whether it's like hummus or pesto hummus or great. Um, mm, a bit of pesto. like feta or something mm. like that to give it a bit of oomph. Like yeah. you can have so Nuts much and variety. Seeds or something. Yeah. Um, also, a big fan of like snacky lunches, um, especially, yeah, I feel like I see a lot of people who are time poor or they're busy or they're like on the go or they've only got so much time for lunch mm. there's nothing wrong with having a snacky lunch if you're ticking all the boxes you know yeah. like tell me um, about a snacky lunch <laughs> <laughs> so it I might be like a couple of like rivita crackers with some hummus and cucumber and then like a boiled egg or a tin of tuna or a piece so what of fruit and like some yogurt beauty therapist <laughs> <laughs> you know if we can't have eggs and tuna yes true you know, okay. I like to the non-smelly foods yeah because um, I like a nice, do not a have a nice a lunch break. garlicky hummus <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's cool. oh, good. Yeah, I would be trying to get in the protein somehow. So maybe it might be like cottage cheese or chicken, ch- chicken. shredded, yeah, shredded, shredded chicken, chicken, or even some maybe not garlicky, but like hummus and some Edam cheese, yeah. some veggie sticks, um, yogurt, like mm-hmm. that anchor protein yogurt's really yeah. good source of protein. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. But it can work. I mean, in the ideal world, we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but. We don't it's live in the not, ideal world. I don't think so anymore. I just don't think that's like a thing it's anymore. It's not possible. You just don't like lay out a table and let's all sit and have breakfast and let all sit. Well, I'm eating on the run all yeah. the time. So eating on the run, like it's still just trying to tick those boxes of like a high fibre carbohydrate, a good protein source and some kind of veggies, fruit. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. We do, um, and when I say we, I mean Sam, we always have the slow cooker on, like mm. every week we always do that and that kind of covers off like lunch dinner as well yeah. and then it's like high protein so you're like satiated yeah so like add some avocado or maybe some rice or whatever and like it's perfect so, yeah, it's so easy it's easy yeah. for me because I don't do it, it but yeah. yeah literally chuck it on cook it for the day or overnight or whatever and it's done yeah. so mm. it's so easy yeah, yeah it's so good perfect um off the back of that we've got what are some examples of anti-inflammatory foods i have endometriosis was told to avoid was told to avoid anti-inflammatory foods. I guess you've covered off pretty much every Yeah, and I'd food. say the the key anti-inflammatories omega-3, yeah. dark leafy veggies, yep. um, things I guess it would be focusing on like a Mediterranean style diet really. Yeah. Mm. High fats, um, yeah. And yeah, like your olive oils, oily fish, um, flax seeds, chia seeds, those sorts of things. Um, and then also on the other hand of that, being mindful of inflammatory foods. So mm. um, alcohol, <laughs> as I'm drinking. <laughs> um, what? Yeah. Say what sugar do you next. mean? What about if you just yeah. drink it straight and like no sugar? <laughs> yeah, you're yeah, I wish that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alcohol is probably, probably the key one um, that's quite inflammatory. And then obviously like things like trans fats and high sugar foods. Yeah. Things that we know aren't that great for us. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What yeah. do you think about coffee? Off topic, but what do you reckon about coffee? Coffee's great. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. So I love you just yeah. said that. I think um, it depends, right? It depends what coffee does for you. Yeah. Um, if coffee makes you really anxious and on edge, probably not. But mm. 
a couple of cups of coffee is is fine. Yeah, yeah. that's I second that. <laughs> um, I guess like I just like reading through the questions. A lot of the questions are. How do you know perimenopause will start? How do you know menopause will start? Like, what do we do about it? There's all these questions that I guess where I am at, I'm 38. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I've talked about this before. I have an underactive thyroid, mm-hmm. so I already have like, you know, like, you know, is that autoimmune? No, it's not autoimmune. Whatever. Yeah. That. Yeah. So dealing with that. And then when you're thinking other things are going on, dealing with stress and that, mm. you know, yeah. it's harder. People wanting to know if they can blame it on perimenopause, yeah. I guess. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's going to be really different for everyone. But how do you know it started? Well, I guess actually just to throw a few facts out there, it can start as early as 35. By 42, 50% of women will have symptoms. Okay. Um, Are you writing this down, Kate? (laughs) (laughs) Can we? After um, (laughs) (laughs) four years, so after four years, 50% of women will still be symptomatic. And after 10 years, 10% of women will still be symptomatic. Please not be one of those 10%. That's horrendous. Yeah, the average average time of symptoms is about eight years. So it can drag on. Yeah. Um, I think how do you know if it started – yeah, it's going to be really different. But going to your doctor and having a talk about the symptoms that you are experiencing, because I think it's really important to firstly rule out, you know, whatever symptom you're experiencing isn't something else, like mm. thyroid or whatever. Mm. So rolling that out, but also just getting clarity for yourself and having confirmation that that is happening and it is normal and, yeah. you know, these are the things that you can do to help. Um and oh my gosh, I forgot to make my blank. I was gonna say something else. I've Sorry. just got on top of that yeah. while you're thinking. So like it's quite hard. So is it an expensive test to test your hormones? Because I requested it yeah. and they were like, You don't need that yet. And I'm like, yeah. No, I wanna know. Yeah. So that's actually what I was trying to remember. Oh my God, how is this? <laughs> is, um, <laughs> There is no test to confirm perimenopause. But like what but the levels of your hormones though, right? Like you can test where they're at. Or well, they not. would be different throughout the month. Yeah, and particularly with perimenopause, because it's such a roller coaster, nothing's gonna make sense during that time because it's gonna be oh, all over the show. So, anyway. so yeah. there's no there's no blood test that can confirm perimenopause. Um, it would be more going to your GP and it's kind of like a process of elimination with symptoms with consideration of age and like family history and that kind of thing. Mm. So like everything's just not that straightforward. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I wish I had the answer, sorry. Because hormones, hormones can actually, like depending on when you get blood tests as well, like even if you get your, because we talked about cholesterol on the phone the other day as yeah, well, I think. Yeah. And it was like even your cholesterol can be different during different times of, you didn't um, say that. But probably I, not cholesterol, but I mean, when we go back to like what I mentioned before about like when we ovulate at peaks and like yes. so depending on what time in your cycle you get your hormones tested, they're yeah. going to vary massively. Yeah, you know? yeah it so, makes total sense. Um, and then you throw Mary, um, Mary Penopause. <laughs> <laughs> Perimenopause. <laughs> and amongst it, it's yeah. just like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. When that word was thrown around, it honestly threw me. I was like, what? Yeah. No, what? And yeah. then I'm like, well, I am 38. It's probably true. Yeah. I think it's cool how more people are talking about it. Well, this is what we kind of want to normalise. Yeah. Like probably f- over 50% of the time when I'm in the salon and these four walls, yeah. women are talking about this. Yeah. What's happening to my body? Yeah. Like, yeah. And I'm no professional. I feel like I know a lot about it now. Yeah, but yeah. like <laughs> they're all feeling these symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's key to talk about it. And also just to, yeah, like normalise it. And yeah. also for... I guess it's like learning about your menstrual cycle as well, but as women, actually understanding our bodies a little bit better Mm. of when we, you know, what's happening when we get our periods and what's happening during perimenopause and what's happening, you know, like I think Mm. it's so important. Yeah, Mm. yeah, Yeah, to know where you're at. Couldn't agree more. Um, There's also a question on here. What do I need to know about preparing for perimenopause as a woman with PCOS in Adeno? Okay, that's going to be... Um, a consult. Yeah. <laughs> to unpack, yeah. That's because, um, I mean, people living with PCOS, even that is everyone's going to be so different. So this is polycystic. Polycystic ovarian yep. syndrome, sorry. Yep. No, um, yeah, no, that's right. You know, like someone living with that, 
they might not, you know, they might manage all their symptoms versus someone else that might feel completely out of control. So it's it's quite different and how you approach um, menopause or perimenopause might be quite different. So mm. yeah. that's kind of a tough one to answer without having without a... Without seeing someone. Yeah. Cool. No, that's all right. And then a uh, question I just had uh, off the back of what you said before is, um, do we kind of look at look to when maybe our parent like our parents, not our dads, <laughs> um, when our when our mums went through perimenopause yeah. and sort of look at is that is is that a guide or is it or could it be completely different depending on different yep. factors or it's definitely worth talking because um, there is strong like genetic components yep. to that so okay. definitely yeah good answer mm. and then how do we how do we combat Pre menopause. Oh, sorry. Perimenopause. Oh, this might be a pre menopause question. Perimenopause. Yeah. So, how do we combat those system uh, symptoms, and what kind of options have we got? Okay. So there are. Uh, I feel like this is going to be quite a big answer. Go for it. Good. Brace yes. yourself, ladies. Nah, you're, <laughs> your goal. Um, because obviously there's a lot of symptoms that come with perimenopause. Um, if we focused on, um say five of the main ones well not main main in my opinion of what um, nutrition could support with um would be like weight gain and changes to body shape bone health cardiovascular health sleep and hot flushes (laughs) um so sounds like lots of fun yeah Mm. and i i mean those five are probably quite common but they are also ones that nutrition can support with. So weight, the changes in weight, um, I think the average the average weight gains eight kilos. So some women will gain more than that. I know it's and bloody you said cruel. Body shape changes as well. So yes. How, yeah. How does that work? As so well? um, many women will feel like they're gaining weight in the like central in the, mid-drift, in yeah. the mid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that really comes down to so before I mentioned that. Estrogen helps us utilise food as fuel more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So with estrogen dropping, essentially we're just not as good at utilising that carbohydrate. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when we eat carbohydrate, it breaks down to glucose and that glucose is our fuel. Mm -hmm. So when it enters the bloodstream, our pancreas releases a hormone called insulin. And that's essentially like the key that opens up the door and allows glucose into our cells to then be used as fuel. So what happens when the estrogen drops is we can experience insulin resistance and that is when the key becomes like rusty and it's not as good as opening up the door. (laughs) Get the CRC. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just wherever you want that to melt away. If only. Is that the answer? (laughs) What, liposuction? Like... (laughs) Yeah, so essentially the key becomes like rusty and the doors don't open as well as they used to and what that leads to is our pancreas producing more insulin so we've got more insulin circulating, our blood glucose is higher Mm -hmm. and that insulin resistance can lead to more of our food being stored as fuel versus utilised as fuel and that often presents in that like central um, weight gain. Also, if you think of us not being able to use fuel as efficiently um that can lead to lower energy levels as well and I think that's got like a whole raft of like a roll-on effect essentially because if you've got low energy levels and you get home and you know you told yourself you're going to go for a walk Mm. yeah it's not and then it's just a roll-on effect (laughs) and it like feels like shit then you're like I didn't do that yeah and then then it's like like, um you know we often choose poorer health choices when we've got low energy levels mm. and it kind of just has that roll on effect not yeah. sleeping well like you said your sleep can be impacted as well yeah we add that in the mix is it too. ghrelin the hunger hormone is that what it's called <laughs> yeah ghrelin gr- what is it gr- ghrelin 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 yeah, <laughs> so evil <laughs> do you know <laughs> this Gina oh, I just I love this stuff like <laughs> ghrelin chatting, chatting to Micah and when we had Becca on I'm like I love these jokes <laughs> <laughs> I love how much she like, didn't even know what, know what ghrelin was how can I put that the in the hormone. Yeah, the hunger hormone? The hunger hormone. The hunger hormone, grillin. Yeah. Um, Sorry, going back. <laughs> yeah, so that's like the weight gain and also we will lose muscle mass. Mm. So um, making sure we're eating enough protein. 
there goes the protein word again. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, so I think pr- but protein is also important for helping with that insulin yeah. resistance. So when we think about how to help with that, it's carbohydrate. We don't need to get rid of it, but it's more making sure it's evenly distributed. We're choosing nice high fiber options, eating it in sensible portions and ideally teaming it up with a protein. Yeah. Um, so that would be the weight side of things. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting because there was a question earlier about how your iron requirements go down like after after once you're in menopause, like full mm. menopause, but that doesn't mean that your protein should go down, right? Like yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and then bone health. So I feel like this one always gets forgotten about because there's more like pressing symptoms mm. um, and it's not something you're going to be like, oh, shit, my bones are getting weak. Yeah, you know, no, like, I like you just did bone health and cardiovascular, CRC's and I was just stop. like, what? Uh, <laughs> well, I just didn't even think about any of those things. Yeah. Like my heart's fine, and so are my bones. So yeah, it's all good. Yeah. And I guess like during this phase, it's probably more like the psychological symptoms that feel well, they are really important. Mm. Um, but it's trying to set yourself up for yeah, like long term health as well. Yeah, um, so yeah, bone metabolism, estrogen again is. Um, heavily involved in maintaining our bone mass so as it drops often our bone mass will drop as well um, and it puts us at risk of osteoporosis so making sure we meet calcium requirements is really important yeah um it's actually quite easy to meet our calcium requirements but a lot of women don't because they might have cut out dairy or they might be you know like whatever they're doing with their diet they might be cutting out some of those high Mm. calcium foods um i love dairy it's fine to have non- dairy milks it's making sure that they're fortified with calcium most of them are now um but nut milks are so shit definitely yeah they don't hit like a good old cow's milk eh? so what's your (laughs) other source of calcium other than dairy um alternative milks that have been fortified yeah um and things like well there's cal- there'll be little bits of calcium and things like veggies and nuts and seeds t- like yeah, tofu not, high. not as high as your dairy um and like a serving of dairy would be like a pottle of yoga or a cup of milk normal milk or alternative milk like a matchbox size bit of cheese I don't know why they compare it to that but yeah they still um, compare it to that eh? like way back <laughs> in the day they compared it to the matchbox I'd like, love to meet someone that eats a matchbox <laughs> of cheese <laughs> like who even cut <laughs> like that eh? matchbox <laughs> um, and vitamin D is really important too because they work together vitamin D and calcium um, potentially again something that's worth getting checked like talking to your doctor about vitamin D a lot of us during winter will become deficient in Mm -hmm. vitamin D because obviously the sun is the best form of vitamin D we can't actually get that much from our diet only in really little bits and it's in an an active form that our body has to convert so Mm -hmm. the sun's the best um and what else did I say cardiovascular health Mm -hmm. again estrogen is involved with having it's a got a protective effect for our cardiovascular health so as it drops things like cholesterol might go up um the really frustrating thing is is that you might be you know you might have eaten the same way for quite some time and had you know a um an exercise regime that you've been doing for a while and your cholesterol's never been high and then you go and get it tested and it's shot up Mm. which is really frustrating because you're like well I haven't changed anything but I think understanding that that can happen yeah and it's normal and it's probably your hormones that have resulted in that um but also knowing what foods can be Be helpful and what foods are probably not so helpful for cholesterol levels as well yeah um and sleep sleep's a tough one because I feel like you could try everything under the sun and for some women they're just gonna be like no I can't sleep Mm, crazy (laughs) Um, eh? what what is it about the process of perimenopause that disrupts your sleep so much is it just that hormone estrogen and yeah. um and progesterone so progesterone also helps us sleep but estrogen is like has that relationship with serotonin and serotonin and melatonin are like buddies Bros. yeah mm. so with those changes it kind of disrupts our ability to sleep as well um obviously trying to have good sleep hygiene and routines but also caffeine I think being mindful Mm. of caffeine um caffeine stays in our system for eight hours so if you have a coffee at midday it's still floating around at 8 p.m yeah um and it might not necessarily be coffee so it might be black tea 
dark chocolate, um, yeah, <laughs> green chocolate tea, night. you know, like there's yeah. so many, there's caffeine in a lot of things. So yeah. it's just being mindful of that. Um, and there's a bit of evidence for magnesium and perimenopause helping with sleep too. Most mm. of us know magnesium can help, but it's just nice to know that there's a bit of research in that particular group of women. Yeah. <laughs> um, and hot flushes. Um, yeah, they're horrible, aren't they? Again, like you could try everything, but it, you might still struggle to get it under control. But obviously knowing trigger trigger foods, so usually things like spicy foods or caffeine, hot drinks, alcohol. All the good stuff. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I think yeah. too we spoke about it in maybe the last episode, Gina said something about it, about almost – normalizing it making a not a joke out of it but like I would just like straight up be like holy shit I'm having a hot flush yeah. like you could talk to anyone about that someone's got a wife a mother a daughter somebody and not that's, making it embarrassing no yeah. it's purely like natural and normal to yeah. do that yeah definitely um yeah so I guess I think yeah 100% talking about it making it normal but I guess yeah knowing what triggers there is also a little bit of evidence around soy consumption and helping mm. reduce hot flushes um I don't know if I should it's kind of boring but go into <laughs> it yes <laughs> not for um, us. soy contains like phytoestrogens have have you guys you know I feel like lots of us have heard about the whole like soy and estrogen relationship mm. mm-hmm, yeah. um so soy has phytoestrogens which so the molecule looks very similar to estrogen um and it can weakly bind to estrogen receptors in our body, um, but it won't act like estrogen. Ah. So what that can do is if our estrogen is really high, it can help to reduce some of those symptoms because in perimenopause it can go sky high and then drop down. Right. Um, So it can help to reduce a few of the symptoms. There's a little bit of evidence for it, but it's like, why not? Include yeah. a bit of soy. Mm. Um, so there was a study that um, they included one cup of, I think it was soybeans or so- soy milk, um, and the participants, 60% of the participants reported that they were free from moderate to severe hot flushes, oh. wow. which is pretty crazy result mm. for including a bit of soy in your yeah. diet. But a mm. tofu? Yeah. But a tofu, yeah. Um, <laughs> and there's a, a lot <laughs> of <a> sponge cake. <laughs> Flavour the sponge, yeah. Um, and there is a little bit as well to suggest that it can help lighten periods, wow. which can be helpful, helpful during that time too. Yeah. Wow. wow. But those would be my yeah, like the key kind of things that nutrition so might helpful. be able to support with. Yeah. Um that's but amazing. I think even talking about this, because often people don't realise, again, like how impactful just these small things that we've just talked about, yeah, um, you know, how much it can help or, yeah, change their change day-to-day. Life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I actually heard this really frightening stat about how um, suicide rates in women um, in that kind of period, I don't know the exact age, mm. but that perimenopausal age bracket the suicide rate goes up yeah because there's so much going on hormonally yeah you know if your sleep is affected you're like yeah all of these things are Im- impacted um and it can put you in a really dark hole really really quickly I imagine and if you don't really know what's going on or you don't have that support that you need from mm. someone that's a really dark place to be so um I think it's yeah. really amazing to have this kind of information out there as well mm. and someone like you who is so passionate about it and so qualified in that mm. you know what I mean like yeah. it's it's quite terrifying yeah. that yeah you can imagine how quickly you could go like being without sleep oh, for a few yeah. days or you're already gone crazy you know like, and if you think like going back to that idea of what those hormones are doing in our body and we're feeling more anxious than usual we're not handling stressful situations mm. or things that might not even be stressful yeah but well, they, then life uh, throws something feel, really stressful then you add in no sleep mm. then then you add in you're gaining weight. Then you add in, you know, like you can see how yeah. quickly that it's can like a flow on effect. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And then throw throw something that life throws at you, you know, yeah. that's heavy or something. And then yeah. all of a sudden, yeah, it's crazy. So yeah. I think it's actually, this has been a really cool chat as well because I think regardless of the age of our listeners or um, you know whether they're males or females because I think males could learn yeah, a yeah. thing or two on how to support you know their partners or, yeah. or, or wives or you know um, or sisters even and I think 
what you've said in terms of all those things that you can do to support yourself through perimenopause, they're actually all beneficial things to be doing before yeah. then. Yeah. So like to get into a routine or to get into, you know, like a really good place with your sleep and your food and your intake and your sleep. And then when you kind of hit into that period, you're almost like a bit more prepared or mm. you've, you know, you've kind yeah. of set up these really cool rituals or routines for yourself. Yeah, for sure. And I think with like, the carbohydrate and protein and I think trying to have a well balance. I mean, we're only human. The perfect yeah. diet does not exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But trying to tick as many boxes in that respect without it being detrimental to trying yeah. to tick all the boxes. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, is definitely setting yourself up to go in. And I think too, like, obviously I'm sitting here, I'm quite far away from perimenopause at this stage, I hope. Um, <laughs> but um, How old are you, 21? 22? But older 20, than us, 27. Renee. <laughs> okay. But you? I think for anyone we should, again, it comes down to learning about our bodies and knowing what's going on. Yeah. Um, whether you've got a condition, whether you've got really bad PMS, yeah. whether you're – trying to optimise fertility, like whatever it is, I think understanding... It's a coffee machine, sorry. <laughs> understanding, yeah, what is going on. Yeah, it's is, so key, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So how do we get in touch with you? So how are we going to, like, if people want to go further and kind of get a consult or yep. is it just kind of like an Instagram? Or yes, so I've got um, my Instagram is fem.nutrition. Um, and then my website is dub 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 dot fem. <laughs> Say that again um, in that voice. Dub 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 fem dash nutrition dot com, and the booking is online. Um, at the moment, all my services are virtual, so we do it via oh, yeah, Google cool. Meet. Yeah. Um, and I've got evening times and Saturday mornings at the moment because I am still working full time. Yeah. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, and. I've actually got a discount code. Oh, Woo! yes. Yay! Show me a while to set that up. Look at you. <laughs> Far out. Um, Hit us with and it. it is BB20 for Whoa, 20% off. Wow. So oh, thank you. Yeah. And um, that will run for a month. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's it's awesome. amazing. Thank you very much. So you yeah. heard it here. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is an infomercial now. Yeah. <laughs> Go up to the website, but wait. 20% <laughs> off. 20% off. So that when they check out, they can put that in yeah, there. Yeah, like, yeah, BB20, yeah. And cool, it'll take 20% so off um, wow. anything. So either initial, I've got a consult like bundle deal that's an initial consult and two follow-ups or just the one-off. Awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for yeah. offering that. Awesome. I have Thanks one more question before we uh, before we leave, leave you to it. <laughs> and that is, what does life look like when you hit menopause and how, like, when you don't have those hormones going through your system mm. and you're up, ups, is life more calm? Yeah. <laughs> like, how does it, what, when what does it look like? you mean? Yeah. Yes. Like so when you're done 12 um, months of no periods, yeah. what does that look like? Yeah, life I beyond. think that there is, there's, like, another side to it. Yeah. Because I feel like all this conversation feels quite doom and gloom. Mm. But there yeah. is another side to it. Um, I listened to a really good podcast by Dr. Lara Bryden, I don't know if you've heard of her, but yeah. she explains it like perimenopause is like the turbulence before landing into like the calm of menopause. Wow. Um, and she also mentioned that there was studies done and women in their 60s and 70s are like the happiest and feeling most free and calm. So I think... Oh, bring it as, on. <laughs> as doom and gloom lots of this conversation is like... It, and the symptoms can go on for some time. Yeah. Um, I guess with the symptoms, there is help. Talk to your GP if you're feeling like it's affecting your quality of life. Yeah. But there is another side to yeah. To cool. Do you yeah. think that plane will land into <laughs> like Fiji or Hawaii <laughs> no, right. or the Maldives? Can we choose where we land? Yeah. Where does the menopause plane land? <laughs> no, nah, that's awesome. I love that. um, thank you so much, Micah, Micah, for joining it's us. It's been amazing. This thank you me. so much for having me. Great been, information. I feel fun. very uplifted. Yeah. And so head over to Fem. 
dot yeah. nutrition <laughs> and into Team your nutrition. code bb20 for 20 percent off <laughs> <laughs> thank so you well. micah <laughs> you're amazing thanks guys thank you <laughs> give me a kill <laughs> look i don't want to talk how you try and press the kid and read it you was soft oh you know what's capping homie you don't know the law pedal to the metal you ain't catching me in park i just hit the stop i don't want to speak talking all that good so i just hit you with the play